Hi everyone. Uh, Center for Wildlife Studies is a 37 year old uh, non-profit organization specializing in wildlife research, conservation, policy and education. Until 2020, uh, we used to host public talks on the latest topics in wildlife science and conservation in our Bangalore office. Due to pandemic, we have instead been uh, conducting a series of webinars online. So far, our webinars have covered a wide range of interesting topics such as public health, zoonotic diseases, um, on species like tigers, elephants, and few birds. If you wish to support our cause or work, please uh, use the QR code and you can donate it, or you, you can go and visit our website, which is at uh, cwsindia.org. So now I would like to quickly introduce. Uh, our speakers dr shermin and dr shermin dr shermin is a, is an assistant professor at the university of san diego she is also a founder and president of trends and leaves incorporated uh, which is a non profit she runs the udavelave elephant uh, research project which is a long term uh, monitoring project of elephants in sri lanka her current research is largely on elephants more heavily uh, skewed towards asia she is interested in studying the response of elephant populations to land use change behavior uh, inside and outside the protected areas and population structure our current uh, research interests include experimenting experimentally testing the response of elephants humans and ecological communities to agricultural interventions designed to facilitate sustainable land sharing with wildlife welcome dr shanan uh Dr. Grima Shannon uh, is a senior lecturer at Bangor University. In his research and teaching, he specializes in animal behavior, ecology, and conservation, specifically delving into the impact of human activities on wildlife, animal intelligence, and the behavioral patterns of larger viewers. His work has been predominantly focused on African elephants, spanning a period of twenty years. Within this time frame, he has explored various aspects such as their foraging habitats movement patterns and intricate social dynamics within elephant family units with special emphasis on the role of the matriarch notably his investigation into elephant cognition have prominently featured the use of acoustic playbacks a method through which he exposed elephant to record the uh, vocalization to study their uh, reactions to social and environmental challenges uh, welcome dr shanan uh my first okay. question to shannon would be uh like what what drew you to the field of elephant behavior and uh, what made you pick a career as an elephant scientist was sorry was that me up first yes you will be first okay uh, i'll i'll go first to that yeah that's a, an interesting it wasn't like a direct line i doubt it is for many scientists that you uh that you were went to university with a clear idea that you're going to become an elephant biologist and i think if i probably had i'd probably not ended up that way because it was a series of fortunate events but that said um i my interest in elephants started out from a young age um driven by many and like many with david attenborough um documentaries and i had the great fortune to meet David Attenborough a few years ago and they would say don't meet your heroes but actually he lived up to all the expectations in a good way which was really nice. So I'd watch one particular documentary which some of you might have seen which is called Echo of the Elephants and it was I think 1993 so I'd be giving away my age or I'd be 13 14 um and that film and Amber Sally and Cynthia Moss and her work studying Echo and the family just absolutely captivated me. I then had the fortune to go to Tanzania in my second degree uh, year of my undergraduate degree and get the first hand experience seeing elephants in the wild and that was transformative. From there on it was a bit more single minded about once I got through to try and get out at least to get experience in the African savanna which elephants was an absolute kind of the 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 dream goal but to get out there So then fast forward what till 2008 another 15 years when I find myself actually in the Land Rover with Echo standing right by it when I got to the opportunity to work in Amboseli National Park where Sherman and I also met and worked together um and continued to do that and it was just fascinating i think it's the animals themselves just the 
depth and breadth of behavior, complexity of their cognition. They're, everything is the superlatives, isn't it, with elephants? They're the biggest. They're the largest brained. They one of the longest lived. They are highly social, highly cognitive. And I think it's that that attracts me to it. And that was a very long answer. So I shall leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shannon. Uh, what was it for you, Dr. Shannon? What made you uh, get into elephant science? Um, I think, so, uh, if, for those who don't know, so I'm Sri Lankan originally, and I grew up here. And actually, my, fav my favorite growing up here was horses. My favorite animal was any, you know, little girls, I guess. But horses are rare in Sri Lanka, right? You, like, you don't get horses in many places, and, you, you know, they're very kind of exotic in Sri Lanka, unlike Europe or, you know, England or... And so, you know, Attenborough wouldn't find horses very exotic, but I found, you know, elephants commonplace because they were here. They're, they're just there. You see them on the street, you know, you see them in the zoo. They like, you kind of take them for granted, you know? So I think the way that some people might view, you know, some livestock or something like cattle or something, this is kind of how people see elephants here. And uh, so that's very unfortunate because then later on in life, you know, and I, I always knew I, I wanted to study animal behavior, you know, because like Graham, I grew up, I, I, I watched documentaries as a kid and I loved animals as a kid. Um, so, you know, I always knew that I wanted to do biology of some stripe, but I wanted to be a paleontologist. So I wanted to study dinosaurs and then my family moved abroad so that I could study dinosaurs. And I carried that idea all the way through college. And I said, I want to study dinosaurs. I picked where I wanted to go to university because they had a museum. I want to study dinosaurs. And then I, you know, I was, you know, also when I was growing up here as a kid, I was not very aware of like conservation or environment or there's any problems. But after I moved to the U.S. and I, and, you know, that came as a shock to me when I learned about it, because that's not something we're taught here. Uh, I, that was not something that came across my radar when I, you know, when I was watching all these documentaries, it never, there was not, never any mention that there were any problems. And so... I kind of switched to wanting to do something more conservation relevant, but I didn't really know what. So I still, I, I, like, I like to study behavior. So I thought maybe I could use that somehow to to help. And then I literally, unlike Graham, I literally went and made a list of like the different species that I might be interested in studying. And, and I was interested in communication and cognition and those. Things. And so I, was, I thought, uh, what are the interesting things you know, and, and I had crows, I had cetaceans, you know, dolphins and things, you know, some primates, I'm not a huge fan of primates, I'd have to say, um, elephants, uh, and, and and then I looked at what species are available in Sri Lanka, so the overlap of those two things, you know, those interesting species, the species that are available in Sri Lanka, and then I went and looked up what research had been done, you know, of course I assumed Asian elephants given that they'd been in, you know, temples and even people had been working with elephants for so long, I thought, elephants, oh, we must know a lot about Asian elephants compared to African elephants, which, you know, don't have such a quote-unquote domestic, you know, sort of um, image. But then I was really shocked that, like, over the past, you know, several decades, a lot of the research on wild elephant behavior, and special, especially social behavior, had been on, at, on, on African elephants, and, and specifically African savanna elephants, not even forest elephants, so, you know, now we know that, that that's two different species, but I'm sorry, you make it crackers. There's some lighting firecrackers. Um, and I was really surprised that, you know, there's a lot of studies on feeding ecology and a lot of husbandry, you know, domestic stuff with, with Asian elephants, but like virtually no studies on social behavior. And, um, and there were some, you know, really old studies from the Smithsonian, which were pretty anecdotal, like people just kind of casually going out and observing. And then there were two studies when I was just, um, starting, there was a study by Roman, by um, Vidya, PNC Vidya, in southern India on genetic structure and social behavior, and at the, and just before that, uh, um, by Peter Fernando, um, in Sri Lanka. So both in kind of like the South Asia region, and those were the only two um, studies. So, I, and, and I was interested in focal communication. I was I had read Katie Payne's book Silent Thunder, and, and that got me interested in you know elephants in general. But then you know. I thought, well, instead of going and, you know, working on something in, in Africa where it's kind of, you know, it's it's fun to be in a new place and but I'd be adding just another brick, you know, in whereas at home in Sri Lanka there's all this, you know, 
there's potentially new terrain. There's you know you can there's a lot to explore with Asian elephants that hasn't been done. So um, so I picked Asian elephants, and not because I was particularly fond of elephants, but but just because of just kind of this practical you know thing. But then you know once an elephant person, always an elephant person. Like you 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 know when you get to know the elephants and. As Graham's saying, you know, you kind of get attached to, especially, you know, there's nothing cuter than a baby elephant. <laughs> I think, you know, there's just absolutely nothing. They're just, they just remind us, like primates, you know, like they do so many things that remind me of humans. That, remind, that um, I think it's, it's also particularly endearing. So, um, yeah, so then I never looked back really. I mean, I, I would be happy to work on other things. It's just, you know, um, then I started this project and kind of, felt like like it's like wine right with like with Ambaselli it's, it's, it's it might not achieve anything near what Ambaselli has managed to achieve but for Asian elephants it's pretty special so I want to keep it going but thank you so much uh, uh, it was like very interesting to know that like two different you know set of uh, way uh, way to go about like in perceiving elephant sense and uh, so following up with um, Dr. Sherman can you speak us speak to us a bit about the Woody uh, research project? I stopped hearing you. Uh, is it any better now? Yeah, I hear you now. Okay. Continuing that, uh, can you speak us speak to us a bit about uh, your Udovalave Elephant project and uh, what are some of the difficulties uh, or like challenges you have faced so far and like, how you would suggest we can you know deal with that uh, so that we can minimize the same. Uh, so uh, when I came to Sri Lanka, I was not planning to start my own project. I was planning to work in another location in, um, where there had previously been research by the Smithsonian, as I mentioned, like way back in the 70s. And so I had assumed that, you know, there was still active research going on and they, like data kind of continuously being kind of like Ambacelli, you know, there was just sort of like this naive expectation that research was still being done. Mm, but um, as it turns out, you know, long-term research is very challenging to maintain. And so, you know, people had sort of like every now and then they kind of would go and like do some like little study but there wasn't anything continuously going on and and, and then to study behavior um i heard from multiple people that Udawalwe was the place to do it because you could see elephants you know all year round uh, which wasn't the case in everywhere and you could you know you could just see elephants <laughs> because with asian elephants as you know you know they're hard to see in a lot of environments they're hard to see outside of protected areas they come out only at night and so there are not many places in the world where you can go and, and you can say you you know you can reliably see elephants um, enough to, to actually do a PhD on and um, so the challenge with Udawawe then was that I had to start my own project which means identifying all these elephants from scratch and I thought I was dealing with a small population of you know people said maybe 300 when I started it was 300 and then every year that the, the you know, people would like add on another hundred. Then then it became you know, oh three fifty. Then it's like four hundred. And oh maybe it's five hundred. And so like no one really knew. And it was all just kind of eyeballing based on you know they would count like a, a, a large group one day. They would you know then they'd count another group another day. And and this is you know nobody recognized the individuals. So they would say oh the elephants you know when you first saw it, like they're out in one part of the park. And then they'd go into the forest, right? And then later in the afternoon, they they would be seen somewhere else, and be like, "Oh, the elephants have gone that way. Like they've gone there," or like, "Oh, today they were he here, but in this area." And then next week, oh, they've like moved to this area. And people kind of assumed that it was the same elephants that was like, you know, moving around. And then, so I thought, well, it should be easy peasy. I mean, not too bad, right? Three hundred elephants. How how hard can it be? And then I was like, I started identifying them, and then it was like, okay, here's the first hundred. Here's, you know, 150, <laughs> here's 200, okay, we're hitting 300 now, and it's still going. <laughs> and so I was like, how many elephants are here? And then we, you know, and then I, and I did the estimate, and, and it turned out to be anywhere between 850 and 1200. And, and that's just, that's just the estimate. So who we're actually seeing is a smaller fraction of that. 
Um, but it was because of this individual identification, which is why it's so important to know individuals, you know, for behavior, you absolutely have to know individuals, but even for counting, like even for demography, um, you know, because people were assuming that the same hundred elephants they were seeing one day was, you know, what you're seeing the other day, but because of this turnover, you know, they would go hide in the forest and another hundred would come out and it's like, haha, tricked you. And so that was a, an unexpected challenge and it turned out to be an important part of the story because, um, Sri Lanka is now estimated to have between five and 6,000 elephants officially. But if that's true in other places, you know, other places besides where I've been working, it means that, that might be an underestimate. And then as we lose forest, and we can talk about this later, but as, as habitats change and those hidden elephants become revealed, people are surprised because they didn't realize that there were so many elephants. And, you know, it's a very different problem you're dealing with, you know, like 100 versus 200 versus 500 versus 1000, like those numbers matter. So, yeah. Totally relatable. Uh, <laughs> what is the, what is that one project you like the most, uh, Dr. Greenman, can you speak a bit about it and what are some of the uh, challenges that, you know, you're facing? Yeah. Years? Um, so really interested to hear it from Sherman's approach because she's actually done the really hard yards of starting a project and, you know, identifying elephants from from scratch. And I've got to be honest, I haven't uh, done that. I've identified a few elephants and built on projects, but generally I've been very fortunate to join others and work across a range of populations. So, yeah, a much more uh, an easier way into elephant biology, maybe. But I have had contrasting experiences in Southern Africa where a lot of fenced reserves, so they have a, a different view on conservation, which is quite interesting, it's successful in its own way, presents its own challenges. But really the the pinnacle for me in terms of, I think the history of the project, the location would be Amboseli in the south of Kenya um, with a view straight to Kilimanjaro. Uh, it's quite the most incredible place. I never been there before until I started the project in, um, with Karen McComb from Sussex in 2007 and just driving across the plains it is the archetypal savannah plains Amboseli very open um again making my work so much easier than Sherman's because the elephants are pretty obvious my wife laughs a lot about this she's a marine biologist and obviously her animals she's a marine mammologist working on cetaceans and she's often laughs at the fact we can't see our animals and we still can study them. Yours are standing right there in the middle of the field. Anyway, so that these arrive there and just see not only the elephants, but the uh, the plain zebra and wildebeest. Seeing the numbers, I'd not seen, I'd seen them before, but not in the numbers you get on the East African plains. That was remarkable. Add to that the first day I went out with um, the elephant researchers there, who are the most experienced and knowledgeable individuals who are Kenyan and have grown up in those regions and know the elephants. And when I say know the elephants, they know every individual. Um, and even before we arrived, when you start to study the family group, they can identify them by rough numbers, the way they walk. It's incredible. And they're a level of knowledge that I, I could only hope to have. And, and I imagine Sherman probably has with her group, just recognizing as if they're familiar friends almost so um the first day we drive out and i turn the engine off two three hundred meters from the elephants in a respectful manner or so i thought and uh katito um who was the research assistant was like what are you doing drive to the elephants and in south africa you don't drive to elephants that can end up with you getting the vehicle somewhat turned over as has happened to me so i trusted her and i drove and we drove amongst the elephants it was the most incredible they paid us little if any attention because these are elephants that have been studied year on year since 1972 so we're talking 50, 51 years this year um so in the park around researchers they basically pay very little attention and she's naming them all as we go and it was fascinating you get an insight that you you would rarely get so i think that really was my kind of the, the peak a lot all the places i've worked have been fantastic but in terms of the the depth of the study and and the, what it allowed us in terms of challenges, they're all self-inflicted. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm very good at uh, breaking vehicles. Um, I've sunk a couple, uh, one in the swamp in Amboseli, um, which was my attempt to drive across the swamp, didn't go so well. Um, keeping the equipment working for playbacks, which you often have very sensitive recording and playback equipment. Uh, we got a speaker design in the UK that could accurately produce elephant rumbles. 
and it was brilliant and it was pretty robust but it had to work year on year and i had to be able to repair it in the field because if that didn't work no experiments happened um so that was quite a challenge and you became quite adept at fixing things and keeping them running as i'm sure anyone who's doing a phd or anyone who's listening has you have to become an expert at all things it's not just the science if you're doing field work you become a jack of all trades i'm sure many people recognize that um and then and then i guess i say self-inflicted one of the times so i used um back in the day when ipods were a thing which i don't know if anyone knows what they are now but they were the first like kind of great thing from apple of listening to music i used mine to play the tracks to the elephants which were elephant rumbles except one day i managed and it took a lot of time to line these experiments up you had to be able to have the elephants in the right place all the individuals ready the right track and instead of playing them an elephant rumble i played them dire straits money for nothing and uh, they just looked at the speaker and walked off. Uh, so, um, and then I managed to attract two buffalo who came and stood right by the speaker and they seemed to appreciate it. So yeah, so those are some of the challenges I faced, slightly different than the order of challenges that I think Sherman faced. Uh, so what is it uh, to work in a place, the star world of elephant biology have worked? So just Ambassador, like you both have worked in Ambassador, can you share a bit about how exciting is it to study the species in the same landscape? um yeah i mean it's 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 remarkable because you are aware of how much has gone before you i think in amboseli and when you're there you're meeting people who you know i think of cynthia moss who has become a colleague and and friend uh over the years but she is like the elephant uh kind of the guru of all things elephant she started that project i say in 1972 and there you are Kind of building upon that that's quite awe inspiring i think um and there's to start that project and keep it running the way it is and i just played a small a very small part i was there for you know on and off for four or five years um i bet then getting the opportunity to meet up with sherman and other researchers who'd be coming in the camp was very it was a hotbed of like kind of elephant researchers and people coming through great ideas a lot of people from the us um people uh, colleagues coming from india so it wasn't just african elephant specialists either people coming to kind of get ideas and plans and get training that then could be used in other parks whether it be within africa or in in asia so i found that i found that really interesting it wasn't just working with the elephants which was brilliant and, and an amazing place to work and i could do experiments like nowhere else but it was also the interaction with people thank you dr green uh my uh, next question is for dr sherman how do you think the cultural reverence for elephants in Sri Lanka has shaped the way the community views the animal today? Um, yeah, so the cultural views, I think that's really, that's a question that I'm really, really interested in. And I, I don't actually have a rigorous answer for that yet. But, you know, the assumption that people make is that, you know, the cultural uh, attitudes should somehow, because people have this affinity across many, countries in Asia, not just uh, Sri Lanka, right? India, Thailand, um, and, and many parts of Asia. That you know, people should somehow be more forgiving, more tolerant, more willing to put up with things. And it's really hard to test that because often we have experiences from one place that you know are, are driving that, and uh, and also a, a view from the outside, from you know, from like say people who don't live with elephants or even within the same country, right? Like you have the urban population, which doesn't have to deal with elephants on a day-to-day -day basis. They love elephants, and then you have a rural population that actually does you know suffer the harm. And so, you know, these these cultural values they exist, and people may hold them, but the extent to which they actually drive people's behavior or shape their you know how they how they actually treat the elephants down i think that's much more complicated and what we've uh found just in the very you know brief time that i've been working and we've you know, started working with the human communities and trying to understand how people think and feel and perceive elephants and what how, how they make decisions i think they're conflicted about it at least in sri lanka because on the one hand they hold very pro nature views pro environmental views they're they're it's quite it is quite different from a, a western kind of use you know exploitative view where you know people uh, you know see nature or wildlife as a resource you know in some cases not all but like you know in some in some populations in, among some people and generally wildlife are not viewed and treated as a resource in quite the, the same way 
but people nevertheless do hunt right they did and and now it's mostly illegal but you know not all people are the same so we have indigenous people we have you know farmers we have people who are now you know the elites and so people's attitudes again if they, even if they hold like strong religious views towards elephants we see that they don't transfer that necessarily towards wild elephants they might think temple elephants are a little bit sacred but they don't think wild elephants are sacred and just because they you know think elephants are important for their cultural you know things it doesn't necessarily mean that people think they can live with them within back in the backyard which is which makes perfect sense right like it would be the same for me um, you know, if, even if I think bears are cute and cuddly at a distance, I wouldn't want a bear strolling through my backyard necessarily, especially if I have, you know, vulnerable family members or even myself. So I think as conservationists, um, you know, we also, I, I have to say, like, you know, when we use this term gentle giants, I think, I think that's a very misleading term, especially for elephants. I think whales are gentle giants that, you know, um, but elephants, they can do a lot of damage. They can do a lot of harm and they do kill people. Um, in, in in Asia, and, you know, in, in India and in Sri Lanka, especially, you know, we're hotbeds of of, the, of this cost of having elephants. So I think um, we can't expect people to just kind of take it, right? And so we 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 really, I think, it may temper their responses to a certain degree, but no further, right? Like there there there's going to be maybe a point beyond which they don't tolerate. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Shannon. I'm sure uh, Dr. Graham would be happy to know that uh, whales are the gentle giants, and uh, you know it's not elephants, and like it could be mistaken. Uh, saying that, I would like to ask him a question: uh, What behavioral and demographic changes have you observed in the landscape you work over the years uh, that is particular to African elephants? Yeah, that's that's an intriguing question. Um... So I think if I think about that in terms of the period that I've been studying elephants, which I take from, I guess, when I started my master's degree back in 2000 and right up till now, I think one of the major things that happened across full range of elephants, I'm talking about savannah and forest elephants in Africa, because that's where my knowledge is, was the rise in illegal killing, um, probably towards the late 2010s into the last decade and continuing now. And that was after quite a drop, um, quite a successful period of reducing the amount of illegal killing of elephants, mainly for ivory. Obviously, and there's conflict um, reasons that elephants may be killed, but it's a, just a tiny fraction of the numbers of elephants that are killed for ivory. And that was one of the things I think over the past 20 years, because you always think that your career is, is fairly, you know, in 20 years in elephant time isn't that much, but actually there's been quite a change, this surge hopefully it's starting to decline again but that's had big implications when you tie that together with rapidly uh altering human landscapes um fragmentation um and pressures on local communities which i think is really what shoma just said it's, it's just absolutely crucial i was always amazed at the level of tolerance to elephants not saying that everyone is tolerant obviously people would rather they weren't there but you have people actually losing their whole livelihood in the night of crop raiding or worse family members i can't imagine what that'd be like i come from the uk where we couldn't even introduce the european beaver it's about this big because people were so worried about it so i feel incredibly hypocritical in our country trying to reintroduce anything is absolutely you imagine the political firestorm but of course over in Africa and Asia, people should live with tigers, elephants, lions, because yeah, so it feels, it does, it just amazes me. But that pressure increases. And I think this is where my work's kind of moving to a little bit on elephants anyways, is more the human elephant dynamic. Because I realised I was really fascinated. I've got to be honest, it was the elephants themselves and the elephant behaviour. It wasn't I was indifferent to people. I'm not, it's just I'm not, I'm an ecologist, I'm an animal behaviourist. But the two things go in hand in hand. The way the elephants behave is the influence that we have had upon them, even in a place like Amboseli, um, and where they do interact with people positively in some cases, but mainly there's some negative and, you know, there's spearing of elephants. There is loss of elephants and that can make uh, aggressive interactions that can change the dynamic of the social group. So I think looking towards ways of mitigating that that's what i've seen i've seen the increasing pressures and i don't know if the fortress conservation of south africa are fencing everything 
is 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 a workable plan in many places. It would be such a great shame in in, in many areas to to delineate. And how would you do it with somewhere like the Serengeti, for example, which is you know so large, such a dynamic open system? And what would you change? Um, I'm not sure if I've answered your question there, uh, but 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 I've rambled for a bit. Uh, that's totally fine. Uh, you know, you pass on your insights. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, so, Dr. Sherman, like you have studied identifying individual elephants. Uh, how important it is for us to study individual elephants or uh, the group in the group, especially like when when you are planning to uh, study behavior or document it. Yeah, I think individuals are important scientifically because, you know, there's really no way you can study behavior in, in detail if you don't know individuals. And I think the more we learn about non-human animals and their cognitive capacities, and I have had to read quite a bit of this for a, a, a book that I'm working on, you know, even fish, right, are capable of self-recognition. I mean, just think about that for a minute. So animals are individuals fundamentally, whether we recognize them as individuals or not. And so I think that just is, you know, that's just the, the baseline that we have to start from. And, you know, I gave you the example earlier of the importance of individual recognition for even something as basic as population estimation, right? Where, where you maybe in many species, we don't have the benefit of recognizing individuals. And so we have to come up with other means of doing it. Um, but in, you know, the case of those that do like tigers and now even zebra or elephants, you know, having the, that individual basis to it i think adds to just a whole new dimension to how you how you can understand the population um then there are of course you know differences in personality and whatnot that people are getting interested in um, which i personally am not studying but you know i think that can be a very important um, part of the story and why you know not just individuals behave a certain way but what happens to populations so um, you know, we have, we were talking about it before the fall, right? We have these individual elephants that pioneer certain feeding tactics, you know, waylaying sugarcane trucks, for example, or begging at a fence or, you know, doing these things that are, we might consider a problem behavior. And, you know, and there are certain attributes, you know, individuals who are bold, who are calm, who are, you know, you know, who are maybe problem solvers, you know, there are these traits that, you know, maybe they're pioneers, but they also are more likely to get killed or more likely to get hurt as a result of that. Likewise, those behaviors may propagate along social networks. Um, and I'm actually quite concerned about problem behaviors propagating, and I don't think that we pay enough, enough attention to that. Um, and it starts with these, you know, it's not hundreds of individuals, right? It starts with just the one. Um, and then other reasons, you know, Graham mentioned echo and, and how that really inspired him to get into conservation and i think really what ultimately gets people is you know emotion right and telling the stories of individuals as empathy has been so, so, so successful at doing um i think we haven't had quite as much with with asian elephants um along the same lines like that you know we, we need to get those stories out and we need to tell those stories because you know i think that appeals to people and and helps to at least draw support you know i don't think there's, there's even, you know, I think there may be even something to getting the farming communities themselves to recognize individuals, because I've heard, again, anecdotally stories of people kind of, once it goes, I, I think it, it's even true of humans, right? Like, you know, people or ethnic groups or races or religions, you know, when you treat them in the abstract as just a class, you know, you can generalize and you can, you know, have opinions about this class of people that may be racist or it might be whatever right but when you get to know an individual and you know their circumstances and their stories that personalization of things i think gives you a very different perspective and can change your perspective so i think that that's really valuable for conservation thank you so much Dr. Uh, that uh, did really answer my uh, question uh, coming on to dr uh, shannon uh, since you said that uh, you also played songs for elephants. I just want to ask a question about acoustic playback. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about your acoustic work and how is how it was uh, how was it like and how much duration did you do it for? Or also, like I am curious to know, like is it yeah, still in continuation? Yeah, no, it's it's quite a nice follow on from um, 
Tim has really good points about studying individual behavior, uh, which is just crucial to get it. Some, particularly when you think with an animal like an elephant, not that this doesn't apply to others. Again, it maybe it's because I know elephants, what I work on so much, but how complex and variable it is between individuals even, and between locations. And, and I'll come on to that a bit with our, with our research on um, the Amboseli population and the population in South Africa, is if you're, the, the demographic changes which are happening at the population level are really important, conservation, and, and both things are important, but understanding the mechanisms and how animals are functioning at the individual level um, is crucial. And before I'd done this work, I'd often known individuals to track them um, more for movement studies, so you knew where an individual was. It's kind of reflecting back on what Sean was saying about that people saying, oh, the elephant's here, then they're over there, except they were different elephants. Like you, you don't know that, you don't know it's an individual. But when I got into the playbacks, the playbacks allowed us almost to get into elephant minds, how they were thinking, how they're perceiving um, situations. And I have to mention Karen McCoom, Professor Karen McCoom, who's at Sussex University, now emeritus, because it was her I went to work with. And she's probably the uh, the leading expert in the field of getting into animal minds. Uh, she just comes up with fascinating experimental approaches on a range of different species. She's worked on red deer up in Scotland, lions and the Serengeti, a lot on elephants, but works quite a lot on horses now as well. Um, but trying to work out how animals perceive the world. And this, and one of the pow most powerful techniques for doing this, and as I was to discover, is using acoustical playbacks. That is, you record authentic sounds of animals in the wild. Um, we used a combination of elephants to elephants, so their contact calls, because they're highly communicative. So going out there recording when they do these calls from different individuals, knowing who called and then playing back, but also playing species uh, across species. So we would play lion roars to elephants in a different combination of numbers and sex of lions to represent different levels of threat. And then, as I mentioned, we've got this big speaker built that was meant to produce the call as authentically as possible. So what you are able to do is manipulate a situation which is experimental in the field that you can control as much as possible, uh, given that I didn't punch on for kind of messing it up but then playing back a situation so it could be lions it could be an elephant and then recording what they did so we'd film all the response and the only way we were again be able to do that is if you knew who you were playing to and what the recording was otherwise how do you ever understand or work out so one of the key elements we were fascinated in is the role of here we go again an individual was the matriarch so in, certainly in african elephants the matriarch plays an absolutely pivotal role um she really does coordinate. She can be quite a despot sometimes. She can really coordinate the decision making. She's often the largest, most, in nearly every case I know, the oldest individual uses her experience to guide the group. And we studied that by, so we'd have to have the matriarch present. We'd need to recognize she was there. And then we'd play these playbacks and then film the responses. And um, so we started out doing social ones and we looked at the social decisions where they could make responses appropriate according to whether they knew the other family or didn't and we found massive differences in our natural population in Amseli and then a, man, a, man, a heavily managed uh, South African population where the elephants were no longer related to each other but more recently we even got into playing them human voices and it's one of those playbacks I'm going to see whether I have the technological skill to share with you a quick video if that's okay of the elephants um, so give me one sec while I just try and share my screen can you just let me know whether you can see, hold on, can you see that? Yeah, thank you. Great. Okay. So just to give some background, we're doing these human voices. So we, what's really interesting about Amboseli is that it is in a region in uh, where the Maasai um, range with their cattle. So they come into contact. It's amazing how the level of coexistence actually but there is conflict there is conflict over resources due to uh, scarcity in periods of cows killed even more unfortunately people are killed occasionally and elephants get speared however there isn't a lot of illegal killing beyond that for poaching uh, the Maasai are generally not interested in poaching so we have the Maasai that live close by and then further away um, you have another ethnic group that tend to be more agricultural based in terms of growing crops don't tend to come into contact with the family groups of elephants, mainly males who might go out to crop raid. And what we did is recorded the voices of both groups of people, um, multiple individuals, and then played them back. And we got radically different responses. This is just according to the voices of who was saying the same phrase, the phrase being, look over there, 
a group of elephants is coming. And I want to show you this uh, paper. I want to take it back to the start. I don't know why it started there. Right, so this is a family group. Can you see the large female at the back? That's the matriarch. Often in African elephants, she'll go to the back. Not always, but often at the back of the group. And you'll see her role here. Now, the speaker is in the longer grass. We never played it from the vehicle because that would confound it with our presence. So they ignored us. But if we played voices of the Maasai or the Kamba from our vehicle, we thought that confounded it. So we had to, this was another added complexity, drop off the speaker in the long grass with a with a delay that then get us into position so it would play to the elephants. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to, let you see, it's, it, there's no sound, unfortunately, but you can see the response. The playback is now, and you can see they all freeze and they're looking towards the long grass. They've heard the voices. And watch the matriarch stand sideways, put quick trunks around. She stops them from running. She stands sideways. And that's quite because they don't know where this threat is. And they immediately look to her, that bunching. And can you see, you can tell that arch back um, ears extended. They're looking around. The other thing, when we did lion playbacks, they were often trumpet and sometimes even mob where the speaker was to get rid of the predatory threat. They almost never did that with human voices. We had silence because humans are too much of a threat and an unknown that it's better to get out of the area quietly and quickly, which is what they did shortly after this video. I'll stop sharing now. So, uh, yeah, sorry, long question, uh, but I thought you might like to see that. But anyway, so long answer. Yeah, the fascinating way to get into the animal behavior world through acoustic playbacks. And to answer briefly, um, we are still working on some of that. Well, I've not been out to Africa to do any more experiments, but we still have quite a lot of data that we're working through. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Green. Uh, my next question is for Dr. Shami. And uh, yeah, like my next question is also matched by uh, an, a person like who is listening to uh, this webinar. He also has a similar question. Uh, how different is the social interaction within herds between Asian and African elephant, considering the star contrast in the in their habitat? So, since you have worked in on both uh, Asian and African elephants, I think like you know, you can go ahead answering this. Yeah. Um, so when when I started working on elephants, I actually I intentionally tried not to read any of Cynthia's books and. Uh, or any or Joyce Fogles or anything like that because I wanted to you know I tried to go in with with a fresh perspective so I had read Katie, Katie Payne's book but I didn't read anything beyond that point and the first thing I noticed when I got in the field and I heard kind of people talking loose you know just sort of casually is that oh you have this very loose social association um use loose associations with um uh, Asian elephants and what does loose mean I mean that's not a quantitative term loose fluid what does this mean and the other thing like that I that you know you just heard Graham describe and also play a video where this, this matriarch behavior is very, very clear, right? Like, you know, it, it's prob it's probably impossible to miss who the matriarch is in a, in a savannah elephant. But I would sit there and watch. And initially I had this thought of like, you know, you know, looking at you know, okay, what what do matriarchs do? And I thought, you know, I had to identify groups from scratch and I had um, I had heard that you could pretty much tell what a group was by the matriarch, right? Um, if you could learn to identify the matriarch, um, you could learn the whole group, uh, the family group. And so I thought, well, you know, it shouldn't be too hard. That should help me uh, identify. And then as I started actually doing it, I realized that I wasn't seeing the same individuals together every day. I would go out one day. I thought I knew, you know, I had identified and gone and gone home and downloaded my photos and started you know, um, labeling them very enthusiastically. And I'd say, okay, okay this is group, you know, one. Um, and then the next day I see some subset of that group and another set of individuals, hang on. <laughs> I can't, so then I couldn't even name them. Um, so I, you know, I started doing the numbers. And so it quickly became apparent something else was going on here, like something different. And they, so that's what fluid meant. It meant that there was turnover. It, there was, you know, there, this group composition was changing at least on a daily basis, if not, you know, if not even shorter. And that meant that there, I couldn't really clearly identify a matriarch at all. Like, I didn't know who that might be. There were old individuals, um, but the oldest ones who seemed like, you know, they they were, you know, the, the grandmothers, grandmothers, and, and they kind of tended to be more solitary. They were on their own. I didn't know who their social groups were. 
and the ones who were just kind of below that, they weren't really bossing anybody around. Um, if you know, if anything, it was some of the more prime age females who seemed to kind of run the show. Um, but that role changed. So the only time you would see anything like what Graham showed was when they were crossing a road, and then you would have you know this this female sort of like guard while everybody crosses the road. And, you know, if you have tourists and people waiting, and you, you've probably seen that. Um, but it wouldn't necessarily consist of the same individual. You know, if they were hesitant, you know, it might it might it would be some of the most experienced female who would guide them across the road and pick the time when they would cross. But aside from like very very small things like this, there wasn't a very overt. And there also wasn't very a lot a lot of aggression. Like I didn't see a whole lot of dominate you know dominance behavior. So so all of this kind of went into my the papers that came out of my PhD and, and subsequently the postdoc when I worked with George Wittemeyer comparing, um, you know, his population, which is in Samburu, which is quite similar to Ambassadeli in many respects. Um, it's had some other social disruptions owing to higher levels of poaching there. Um, but the family groups th there have also been disrupted to the extent that, you know, they're not as, you know, they're not as, they weren't as intact and multi-generational, but they had quite high levels of aggression in his data. And, and so we're just comparing one population to another. So, you know, you can't generalize, you know, across this, if anything with elephants, you know, populations vary a lot. Um, and, but what we see is that across this kind of East African savanna type context where the, where, where the African data set came from and, and Sri Lanka, we had, we had the time that I was working, we had an ecological similarity because it was also sort of savanna like grassland. We had very tall grass and, and, and so you know, it was as close in Asia as you could get to having a sort of African savanna type ecosystem. Um, but you had this fluid behavior. And my thinking was that at the time, it seemed like it was a very productive environment. So it seemed like we had a lot more, we have a lot more rainfall, the vegetation is a lot more green. And you could just see that like, you know, even water, you know, it's a lot more, you don't have to walk for days and days to find water. There are water sources, kind of small ones everywhere. And it just seemed like, under in, in that situation decision making is a lot less costly right your, your mistakes are not necessarily fatal and on top of it in sri lanka we also don't have large predators in india you have tigers which can prey on calves or you know, but here we really don't even have that the largest land predator is a leopard which doesn't really pose much, pose much of a threat for elephants so they could pretty much go wherever they wanted so in, in that situation why would you tolerate being dominated by somebody else you know if you're fighting over shade you don't like this tree go over there somewhere else and I think that fluidity underpins everything else. Um, and I think we could we could we could tell a longer evolutionary story about it. And 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 what I've found over the last ten years is that the environment is very dynamic here because we have a lot of invasive species, as you also have in India, I'm sure, and in many parts of now in Asia. And the landscape changes, and um, you know, and so you, it, it's kind of actually hard to say what ecologically speaking what exactly these elephants were experiencing and how what they were adapted to before you now today before the last 10 years because the landscape is so dynamic but overall that that was my thinking um i think to find more support for that we would really need more people to study elephants in other places under different conditions and see how that changes so there have been those studies by vidya and her students in southern india which are you know show kind of an intermediate um, level of like social stratification and also dominance interactions compared to to mine or George Wittemeyer's data sets. So I think to really understand, and, and for Savannah elephants as well, you know, there are so many different populations. I think it would be, it, 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 we, we would, the more we can study others, I think the more we'll learn about elephants. Thank you, Dr. Shami. Um, Going back to uh, Dr. Green, what are some of the important management concerns regarding elephant habitat conservation in African context? Um, yeah, I think this is this is one of the key issues, isn't it? The the availability of range, um, maintaining elephant populations in the first place, and uh, against illegal killing. But also that they actually have uh, savanna range available um, to support populations, functioning populations. And again, this is kind of getting to the fact that elephant population is very complex in the interactions 
the social dynamic. It's not just a numbers game. So I think, yeah, for me, the getting on top of the illegal killing and the pressure and demand for ivory and that criminal syndicates have got involved in that much more now than possibly in the past. It was always that, that it's become wildlife trade, illegal wildlife trade is a huge generator of income. So I think, and that's weird. You'd be like, well, that's not habitat per se, but I think that needs to be one of those things that's addressed. But then it is, it's, it's a realization that there are resource requirements of the population of Eastern, Southern, Sub-Saharan Africa that need to be prioritized alongside the elephants. It's how we do that and in, a, in as sustainable manner as we can and try and keep areas which might be priority for linking, you know, the corridor theory. I think corridors have great potential to link up populations of elephants and keep animals moving between dry and wet season ranges or even between different populations with like maybe Amboseli and to the south into Tanzania and Serengeti. And that can be done with existing land and also the involvement of communities and for them to see some of the money, particularly from tourism. So you talk about how are elephants viewed. It's very dynamic. It's very different. But people also see there's a lot of tourists, wealthy, very wealthy tourists coming in to look at those elephants. That money doesn't necessarily disperse at any level around those who are paying for, you know, the greatest cost in terms of the elephants being their neighbours. That I think could change to be able to see that there is actual value economic of having the elephants as well with it greater involvement of those communities and engagement and um yeah and that they saw some value at that level so i think it's maintaining the connectivity reducing the amount of poaching and illegal killing but also doing it in a smart way is we can't conserve as you know the whole elephant range it's not a realistic um goal and, and, and it shouldn't necessarily be. We've, we've human population um, has changed, land cover has changed the demands of people. Um, and it's unfair for me to be saying, well, you need to conserve. It's just like we're coming back to so conserve because I suggest that you should do that whilst I'm sitting in my, you know, should we say, ivory tower on the other side of, of the world where there's very little wildlife. We've denuded most of ours. So I think it's a recognition that not all of the areas will will um, be in a position where you could save it, but that we need to be smart and thinking linked up, not just focusing on individual populations, but working with elephant biologists, government policy across across Africa. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Green. Dr. Shaman, what do you think uh, about it in Sri Lankan context or like Asian context in general, and how important it is for us to uh, plan conservation tools strongly based on science. Um, I think I, I think that's why I do science. I think I mean science is uh, important. Uh, so our tagline is evidence based conservation. Our you know transparently is facilitating evidence based conservation. It used to say science based, but I think the important thing is however you view you know evidence or science, it, it's that you have something that's not just a story or a narrative or you know that giving you the rationale for why you're doing things and 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 the way i view you know like i i almost see it like it's like trying to build a legal case right like you're, we're trying to build a case and bit by bit we're gathering evidence that something you know we think is true is you know is actually what's going on we don't know for sure but you know here's the the bit by bit case one of the cases that i'm trying to build and this just tacks on to what graham was saying and i don't know if you're going to ask this question later on is about land use change and 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 the you know that's the that's the big story um it's you know we may be very aware of the recent land use changes um but this paper that we just recently published um earlier this year um is about the long-term changes that have been going on at least in asia um but also around the world so this you know these data sets are, are global um and and how how that has affected the availability of habitats for elephants. So, if, um, so here is a point where I actually will share the screen a bit. Um, so this is this is from uh, a talk I've been giving multiple times now or this year, but this is one of the um, major results. So here we have in yellow the the suitable habitat in the 1700s, and here we have the suitable suitable habitat in 2015. And you can see, like you know, this. It's, it's like it's like taking the heart out of elephant country here in, in central Thailand. Um, and likewise, it's, it's smaller here, but you can it, it, a lot of this 
change happens around right around the industrial revolution and following that colonialism so colonial, colonialism was going on before but it's really you know it's those practices that were put into place all over the globe in asia and africa right with with forest management and rangeland management that i think is responsible for all this that includes the displacement of indigenous people of you know of other traditional methods of land management so this human piece you know what we kind of aspire to today as coexistence you know what was going on here for all that time people were in those environments right people were living there it's only in the last 300 years that we have this conflict and of course we have an explosion and we have population growth um, in thailand this actually happens not in the 1700s but in the 1950s following the second revolution which is the green revolution um so a lot of you know this area uh, this area is lost to permanent irrigated cropland as opposed to earlier methods involving for example shifting cultivation or seasonal cultivation other kinds of agriculture uh, if we look at sri lanka here um in in larger scale so here's you know here was the heart of sri lanka's elephant habitat this is the central highland where elephants would have been once upon a time like all of this would have been elephant habitat but not the best so down here when you lose that they're going to be displaced so we have this 300 year you know process playing out and then on top of that we have the you know 10 20 30 year process playing out where we have land use change which are the more intense land use change areas in red and the elephant conflicts or the or, you know the density of elephant conflicts and they they correlate with land use change and the more land use change you have the more fragmentation you have in sri lanka you know especially since the war it's just been going up astronomically it's it's you know it's such just it's such an obvious correlation and it shouldn't take data to tell you that but it's nice to have the data um because then you can't you know turn away you can't you can't you can't make up a story <laughs> some other story so i think um data is absolutely important and sometimes that data can be controversial and it may not be what um people want to hear <laughs> But I think we have to keep, you know, as scientists, you you have to sort of balance things, right? You have to play this game of like being an advocate, but but also not being biased. <laughs> and so I think we have to try to present the, the data and what we think the data is telling us, um, regardless. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. What do you think about uh, evidence of science-based, uh, you know, conservation plans, Dr. Green? Sorry, just, could you just repeat the question? Evidence of? Okay. Uh, so continuing to mm. Dr. Shami, I was just asking you again, uh, what do you think about uh, science-based conservation plans? Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with what uh, Shami, I think that's fascinating looking at it over that kind of period. We do tend to have rather short-term perspectives sometimes because so much, our new baseline always seems to be in the 1970s, as if the 1970s wasn't already transformed enough. You see a lot of these biodiversity declines, particularly um, reported in the UK, but other places that seem to have the 1970s as somewhere we should aspire to. And I saw someone on Twitter recently saying, well, hold on, 1970 was a book like, couple hundred years already into the industrial revolution how how, how is that our, our baseline there was some pretty egregious kind of um, biodiversity decline that had already occurred so i think looking back and having a kind of longer perspective um both looking back and looking forward where do we plan not being too reactive we've got to be aware that we don't have resources for everything and we need to target those resources and it needs to be no fully agree evidence-based um it is great to come up with, uh, yeah, it's hard as well, because you're obviously quite passionate about it. Most of us are who work in conservation, have a passion for the animals before maybe becoming scientists, but they need to back it up. You need to be able to back it up with solid evidence, particularly because you're going to meet quite a lot of resistance from those either that have a vested interest in land use change and, and, and for good reason, many times, you know, these are people that need livelihoods, but also that may work, may be making a, a lot of money off it, you know, and so to convince governments and officials and to make it hard to turn away from as Sherman said I think and that is the case and in Africa I think it, that's been one of the, the, the success stories has been a greater kind of use of evidence collection of detailed data and bringing that data together so we've got a better overview of what's going on um, across the continent because it's a huge area of Saharan Africa involving multiple range states as well. Thanks for that.
uh, question again to you, uh, Dr. Jain. Uh, can you share any coexisting story from the place that you have worked? If you have. Yes, of course. Uh, just being aware of time, I'll probably keep because uh, I think we're already over. But uh, I think I'll just reiterate the working again in Amboseli, which, as I say, was uh, is an area that's inhabited by Maasai. And I was quite amazed at the low level of poaching that Amboseli is actually. So t- can, uh, East Africa has been through periods, particularly again in the 70s and more recently in Tanzania, of high illegal killing of elephants. Amboseli has been one of these kind of areas that's actually bucked the trend. Um, there has been elephants that have been killed, but rarely for their ivory. And that's because the Maasai um, tend to be very um, intolerant to people coming in and poaching on their land, to be honest. Um, so they coexist with the wildlife. They, as long as the wildlife doesn't um, cause them problems, if it does, they will kill lions and elephants. Um, but they don't kill them for their ivory. They don't kill them for um, economic gain, generally. I mean, these are big generalizations I'm talking about. But you can see the patterns playing out. It's complex. Um, there is friction, particularly during periods of resource scarcity over water access. But I was amazed at that level of kind of rubbing along that seemed to occur between the elephants in the population and the people. Um, it, as I say, it goes through but different periods, and it can and uh, there can be there can be challenges. But that was one of the most interesting things to me that played out across the region, and you can compare it to neighbouring regions or across the border in Tanzania, where there was a vastly different experience going on with illegal killing. So I found that because Amboseli itself is 300 square kilometers, it's very small, but it exists in a uh, ecosystem of five, 6,000 square kilometers. So you, you do, they have park ranges and everything else, but if you have the community on side, which it's, I don't want to tell stories if everything's perfect and it's kind of, you know, that, uh, that there is friction, but if you have community on side supporting you, it's quite amazing what difference I think that can make. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, th- and also thanks for reminding about the time. And uh, this would be my last question to Dr. Shami. And it's a question from the audience, uh, Meg Landry-Kombe. I hope uh, I'm pronouncing it, pronouncing it uh, right. What do you think about the future directions of elephant conservation or behavioral research? Sorry, the second part of that was what, what would be the future di- directions for behavioral research in yes. conservation yes um yeah so uh so what we are now uh trying to do is trying to understand how elephants behave outside of protected areas so from i think everything we talked about but we have we haven't like you know put a fine point on it which is that you know in in many cases, we're studying elephants in protected areas, like Amboseli or Udwale or whatever, but they're also ranging outside of protected areas. And in Asia, in, you know, especially uh, protected areas are small and on average, and they tend to be biased. They, you know, in, in Southeast Asia, especially, they tend to be biased towards rugged terrain or hillsides. And so we, we can't really protect elephants and we can't conserve them if we ignore what's going on outside of protected areas. And that's, of course, really, very, really difficult because uh, Asian elephants are very shy outside of protected areas and generally can't, you know, study them as easily and observe behavior like we take for granted in flight. And so we need to use other tools like camera traps and whatever else we can get our hands on, you know, or, or maybe you know, microphones, you know. So whatever we can do to, to observe elephants, it, it, we're not going to be able to collect the same level of, of detailed of data. Um, but I think... It, and, and in some places, you know, in, in, there are cases, of course, like tea gardens and, you know, and some, you know, some areas uh, that are not strictly, you know, considered protected areas, like certain kinds of plantations and whatnot, where you might still be able to directly observe elephants. Um, and I think understanding how elephants are actually sharing the landscape with people um, is really important. And because, you know, just the mere presence of an elephant is not necessarily a threat, but that doesn't mean people have to be comfortable with them. But we we really need to understand what elephants need, and uh, and even even something as simple as when you know when elephants move between forest patches, or say they're moving between protected areas, you know what we call corridors. You know, people tend to have an idea of a corridor as a sort of a narrow thing and want to preserve a narrow thing. Uh, but if you look at Sri Lanka, you know the corridor is there, 
the elephants are in the corridor, but they're also outside it and they're all around it. And there are villages and there's houses and there's, you know, there's, it's, it's a very complex landscape where the elephants are there, but you wouldn't know they're there most of the time. And, and, and I think, I don't know how unique that is um, because, because of this just exceptionally high density of elephants that we have here. And also the, just the numbers, the sheer numbers of people that are overlapping with elephants. It may be that they've just gotten used to it over a very long time, but we're pushing that, you know, we're pushing that. So I think other, you know, other really important things, um, I think it's, it's uh, the, the concept of culture is relatively neglected. Any any species that is capable of learning is capable of culture, uh, but any, especially anything that's capable of social learning, I think those are really important. And I, I mentioned problem behaviors earlier, but in the transmission of problem behaviors and just sort of documenting things that populations seem to do kind of locally. You know, we don't have a lot of comparative studies. We have a handful, like what I was talking about, between Asia and Africa. But it would be amazing to have more studies of elephants in other places so that we can compare different populations. And um, so I think, and because I think that is also really important for conservation, because there may be, you know, local adaptations, local sort of know-how, if you will. And you can't just, you know, treat all elephants as being the same. You know, not all individuals are the same and not all populations are the same. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Green, uh, so today we are commemorating Elephant Day. Uh, and do you have a general message for the audience and for the conservationist who wants to contribute to, you know, uh, saving the species? Yeah, I think a message of optimism. I think conservation can be hard on us. I think it can be depressing. It feels like you're fighting an uphill battle. Um, a lot of the time, particularly, um, and social media can be can amplify that, I think, because we hear from certain platforms more than maybe we should. Um, but there are wins. There are people that genuinely care about this. This is important. It isn't just about elephants either. It's the um, it's it's the broader conservation of forests, their habitats, the impacts that has on biodiversity. Um, I work on um, slightly less exciting animals, but deer a lot in the UK and deer are hugely important ecologically, but the numbers are very high in the UK. We have no natural predators anymore and we're trying to reestablish forest. We're very low forest, probably the lowest in Europe. It's about 12, 13 percent cover. And we want to change that for obvious reasons, because it's a great way of sequestering carbon to increase biodiversity. Two things we're not doing very well at. So the same and there's been links between the importance of elephants for maintaining forests uh, where you have, I know I work in savannas, but more forest elephants for um, distributing seeds for actually the carbon sequestration that they're involved in for their processing of nutrients. So it isn't just the elephants and their value, which is hugely important just for the sake of being elephants. It is everything it's linked to as well and all the elements. And I've seen someone was asking about uh, a question directed about uh, epidemics and disease. Elephants are interesting. I haven't studied one. They don't show a great deal of disease, really, elephants. I've done words in them. The one I can think of is in Botswana recently. We had a breakout of anthrax, uh, interestingly, and there is concerns that that might be increasing with uh, changing climate as well. So they are susceptible and anthrax exists in the soil and occasionally gets into water holes and you can get big die offs. But it's quite hard to track anthrax die offs after it's happened, unless you get there very early. So that's I'm um, just answering that question. But so we, what I'm making from that point is we need people coming from all angles at conservation. And it is a changing hearts and minds as well. It's great that we all believe in it. And I think by just, you know, the fact we're here on Saturday evening, Saturday afternoon discussing elephants, we're preaching to the choir in some ways. It's getting that information further on. Um, and there's lots to still explore. There really is. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Green. Now I would like to end the webinar with a message that we, we should definitely work towards uh, conserving this amazing species. And thanks to one and all for joining in. And thanks to our speakers, Dr. Dream and Dr. Sherman, for agreeing to attend and uh, speak about their work, even with the shortest of notice. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, thanks for all my coming. Pleasure. I noticed that even one of my uh, my old uh, tutees came along from Bangor University. That was Meg. So nice to see Meg joining us as well. Thanks all. Well, yeah, thank you very much for organizing and for inviting us. It was a pleasure. Thank you all. Good night. Bye. Take care. Bye.